My name is Wang Wan Kim. I'm the executive director of the Multicultural Collaborative. And I want to thank you for taking time out to celebrate with us this afternoon. The Multicultural Collaborative was created in response to the Los Angeles 1992 civil unrest. It works for social justice by supporting the development of boundary crossing relationships and networks that can more effectively address institutional policies and practices that exacerbate racialized conflict. The fo this focus is rooted in the MCC's belief that the fires and looting that erupted in 92 had much more to do with dismal and oppressive economic and social conditions in the neighborhoods at the center of the violence. Our work is focused on strengthening relationships among groups committed to social justice change and providing the support for them to identify and implement strategies for collaborative action. <clears throat> Reflecting back on that painful and tragic moment in our collective history, I remember the numerous promises, the rhetoric and posturing of too many elected officials and civic leaders. We remember the promises of jobs, economic development, resources in the billions. I remember George Bush Sr. coming into town on the politician circuit, walking through burned out buildings and businesses, strongly condemning the perpetrators, which was a code word to unleash the punitive arms of the government to arrest and deport who they perceived as the enemy. I also remember our state government headed by Pete Wilson at that time, remember him? Voted against passing a statewide temporary sales tax of 25 cents. You remember that? 25 cents, what does that mean to people? But that didn't pass because the conservative members of our state government felt that it would be wrong to reward violent and destructive behaviors. Why should we pay when they burned down their own neighborhoods. There was a federal initiative, Weed and Seed. Who thinks of these names anyway? Weed and Seed, which was designed to root out the bad and seed with the good. We felt the weeding, but we didn't feel, we didn't see the seeding. Today, 10 years later, the mainstream media and many civic leaders ask, how are race relations now versus 10 years ago? To them, I have to refer to a mantra repeated during Bill Clinton's first campaign for president. It's the economy, stupid. But I don't believe in trickle-down market forces solving the problems of poverty in America. Even George Soros, one of the wealthiest capitalists in the world, in his recent book on globalization, says that financial markets are amoral. Its sole purpose is to maximize profits. He talks about the importance of balancing market forces with major investments in public mechanisms to keep the playing field more level. To put morality into our society, we cannot rely on the private sector. It wasn't designed to do that. By RLA's own estimates at the time, indicated a need for 75,000 jobs and $6 billion of investment just so that South, South LA can reach parity with the county. As you saw from the video from the 60s, South LA has lost hundreds of thousands of blue collar union jobs that did not require high school education. Those jobs are non existent now. Los Angeles County data reveals that children living in poverty has increased by 20% over the past decade. Increased. This is what the media should be covering. Not how African Americans and Korean Americans are getting along these days. Much more than interpersonal or inter-ethnic enmity, the LA civil unrest was about failed political leadership, decades of capital and job flight, 
and public policies that undermine the spirit and hope of the families and communities we care most about. The theme for this event is about collective promise because we know we can't depend on the promises of our institutional leaders. With isolated exceptions to the general rule, our institutional leaders have failed to fill the void of decades of racist policies and practices in both parties of our government. Policies which have gradually but consistently decimated our communities. In our search for leaders and heroes, we need to direct our attention to neighborhood folks neighborhood groups. There are numerous examples of Mrs. Washington or Mrs. Kim or Mr. Hernandez right down the block who committed a heroic act based on their moral principles to do the right thing. And despite all the barriers erected against them, their humanity and sense of justice has not been taken away. These groups and many others like them are not just about improving the lives of the most disenfranchised, they're about improving the quality of life for Los Angeles. But rather than speak about broken promises, I would rather t speak to you about promise, promises to be made and promises to be kept. For the real promise lies with those of us in this room and others we work with. We can and must overcome our differences, our turf issues, because in the larger scheme of things, they mean very little when compared to the economic devastation that will continue to steamroll over poor communities of color. We've got to build strong and lasting relationships of trust and, as Bell Hooks writes about, perhaps even love. I am here to offer you our promise to contribute to the effectiveness of groups like you and the awardees this afternoon who are working to organize to recenter the power base. I hope today, if nothing else, that you will talk to someone you don't know, who you haven't met before, exchange contact information, and pursue some new relationships. Make a small promise to someone new. This may lead to larger promises down the road that you know will be met. That's what quality relationships are all about. This event is one way in which the MCC is working to, re working to recognize the importance of building power where it is needed most, in communities. For it is at this level where the power to be an active participant in policy making and to demand greater institutional accountability must be built. We thank you for taking time out from your important work to briefly celebrate the significant strides that have been made in the past 10 years among social justice and social change organizations. And you, you continue to inspire and motivate each other to continue working for social change for the communities we belong to, the communities we care most about. As some have said, peace is not just the absence of conflict, it's the presence of justice. And lastly, I would like to recognize our small but dedicated staff for making this event possible. It is they who came up with the idea of organizing today's event, and it is they who made it possible to come together in a spirit of sharing and celebration for victories that are too often ignored in the public discourse around race and justice. Thank you, Marisa Aguayo, Yusef Omawali, Benny Torres, and to our interns, Mary Episcopal and Susan Israel. And to the Board of Directors for continuing to believe in and act upon the realizing the promise that gave birth to MCC in the ashes of the civil unrest. Thank you, and let's have a good time. Good afternoon. My name is Benjamin Torres. I am a program director with the Multicultural Collaborative, and I will be the program facilitator. And it is my hope that I will be the most insignificant part of the program. If, I, if that happens, then I've done my job. OK, uh, we'd like to start off the program, or continue the program, with a grounding ceremony. Uh, we'd like to incorporate culture, ritual, 
uh, into a lot of the work that we do at the Multicultural Collaborative. And so we'd like to take this time to bring up uh, the Reverend William Jarvis Johnson, who's a pastor at Calvary CME Church. Could you please come up and do a grounding ceremony?
creation to describe discipline and originality, grievance and re resolution, passion and holiness. What is marvelous within us?
Joshua sounds like forever. Thank you. 
would sing our people away, our children into safety, our men into honor, ourselves into our rightful place among the women who created worlds with just the mention of their names. If I could sing, I would sound like Dwight Trimble. Six years ago, acquired a rundown California craftsman house, not far from the corner of Normandy and Adams. And the house has really served as a metaphor of what Sage has been able to build and accomplish. Because as the building was repainted and, and furnished, and as life and energy came into the house, so too did the programs of Sage. And now it is always a center of tremendous activism and hope, whether it is organized with tenants, with welfare recipients. SAGE worked with the state of California and developed landmark policies to provide banking access. I'm the founding director of SAGE, and um, one of the things about uh, you know founding directors, you have all this responsibility, and you have to you know build all this stuff and build an institution. But because our work is grassroots, and because um, the way that we've won our victory is by people from the grassroots really learning and doing and teaching us. Um, we keep starting SAGE over and over again, which isn't at all burdensome. It's, um, it's renewal all the time, and we're, we're really building a movement here. And so I'd like to um, introduce a, a couple of the people who've been uh, the foundation. Our banking program, we passed a state law. Um, that requires um, all of the counties in uh, California to offer direct deposit to uh, people on welfare so that they can get free bank accounts. Then we negotiated the first um, welfare to work bank account with um, Washington Mutual and we're going from bank to bank to bank so that we're now we're creating immigrant banking programs and um, in the Figaro Corridor. We've been told that we won the biggest community benefit package ever in the history of the country, and this developer wasn't a slouch. This is like Rupert Murdoch and Philip Anschutz, okay? And um, that's not the big deal. The big deal is making it work. Okay, so now our work is really, now our work just begun, and so the way that we're doing that too is with the people who are standing up here. So, friends, we have people up here who are on the committees that are implementing our agreement with Figaro Corridor. We have people up here who are, were taught by SAGE how to open up a bank account and how to, um, they, they, got, they got our state law passed and now they're teaching other people and really spreading and spreading and spreading. They're peer educators and I'll turn it over to Sister Brenda and then I guess Sister Brenda will turn it over um, to whoever she likes as well as Abby who, who will be talking about Figaro Corridor. I am one of the constituents that SAGE um, has trained. I started, I met or was introduced to SAGE while I was in a shelter program with five of my children. SAGE came and they were talking about direct deposit. I got involved and I got one of the Welfare to Work Transitional Banking Program Accounts with the, one of the banks. From that point, I began to see and learn how being in the mainstream of things was so important. So my life has been changed, and at the same time, being involved uh, with SAGE, it caused me to go through a peer training curriculum that they offered. Then I became an intern and now I'm a financial educator on staff. And of course, we need people and organizations uh, to step to the fore uh, to look beyond just a question of sort of race identity and race identity politics, but to really be about building these bridges, to really be about things that really matter to all of us, whether it's jobs and education uh, or economic development. So it gives me great pleasure to bring up uh, the folks from Youth in Action, which itself is a collection of, of 
youth groups, including uh, uh, youth and environmental justice, youth organizing communities, uh, South Central Youth Empowered Through Action, uh, Youth United for Community Action, Wise Up, uh, and the Southern Californians for Youth, if those folks could uh, step up. After the civil unrest and young people still face a variety of issues and a lot of oppression from broken down schools to not having enough books to apathetic teachers and counselors to um, having to take a standardized test that punishes them for, for doing poorly instead of helping them from a curriculum that doesn't teach the roots and struggles of people of color from the police, from the impacts of toxic pollutants in our communities because there are so many factories and diesel trucks, and having access to higher education because of our immigrant status, and in general not having enough young people of color um, going to college. And so, you know, there's a lack of opportunities for young people, and in particular, young people of color. So what opportunities are there um, that's, uh, that's out there for them. If they're being pushed out of school, if um, the only opportunities that they have uh, is being tracked into a low-wage workforce, uh, you know, into, into prisons or into the military. And, you know, as young people of color, that has like a very direct impact. And in addition to that, you know, in general, young people's voices are not being acknowledged or heard. And in 1998, um, you know, with th these issues in mind, Youth Action uh, was created because there was a need for youth organizers to come together. You know, we were all doing good work, uh, we were, but we were isolated in, you know, South Central, Southeast LA, Mid City, um, and there was no communication. And you know, and if you really take a look at it, like all we have, you know, it's is each other, you know, people in this room and out there in the community. And you know, we felt that there needed to be a safe space where young, could, young people could share their experiences and support each other in the work that they do. And with the vision of creating a network that would strengthen the youth movement for social justice here in LA. And you know, the reason why I got involved, you know, in 1998 and why I'm still involved now is because, um, I believe in young people. I believe in their creativity, their spirit, their energy, their voice. And you know, I believe that we need to organize those that are directly impacted, you know, for social justice. For environmental justice, and I'm 18 and about to graduate from high school, uh, from Bell High School. And I just want to say that I'm excited to be here today in recognition for the work Youth in Action has done. And in the past four years, uh, we have successfully accomplished four Youth in Action conferences uh, with, issue, with issues ranging from environmental justice to immigrant rights and from public speaking to arts in action. And just to think that four years ago Youth in Action was created in order to get different youth groups together to share their different experience, experiences and to learn from each other about youth organizing and then it began to evolve. In our second year we addressed that push to defeat Prop 21, and yet while it's still passed in California, we were able to prevent it from passing it within our areas. Then in the third year, it was all about education, not as a privilege, but as a human right. And then by the fourth year, this last year, we were determined to revolutionize the mind because we believe that in order to create a better society, the change has to start up here. So, well, yeah, and so then this coming year is our fifth year. And throughout this process and throughout the four years, we have, create, we have created a strong working network of youth groups throughout the South, Southeast and East Los Angeles area. And I am grateful that something like Youth in Action exists that creates a safe space for youth like myself to be able to organize and to be able to walk into an unfamiliar room with people I have never met and, people, and be able to produce and create something that we have only visioned. 
and then to work with people I didn't normally grow up with because I, I grew up in a, a mainly Latino community and so to be able to grow up with people of different age, I mean to be able to work with people of different age, gender, and race and then forget that we are of different age, gender, and race um, was, pretty, was actually pretty cool and to learn from each other and that's why I got involved and I'm still involved to this day. Thank you.
Also, um, you know, they have the Power Builders Program, which um, we are also, um, we also has uh, guided it and are using part of it in part in, in, in our organization where we have it in, uh, implemented in the school. Because I believe that we should take some of this knowledge and uh, into our neighborhoods. And actually some graduates from, uh, from, uh, from the Powers Building Program did a, did a presentation at our, at our school. So we can see the fruits coming out of this program and that's why we should support it. Um, so I am honored to uh, introduce the Los Angeles Bridge and uh, well, the yeah, Gang Violence Bridging Project.
Um, but, but it's really important that we, we took that approach because uh, the networking was important because we needed to know that, um, you know, what were the other options that are out there? Because sometimes what happens is that we just get so involved in what we're doing, we don't realize that there's a large number of people that are doing stuff already. You know, and, and there's nothing wrong with asking for help, you know, and saying that you don't know it all. You know, because none of us do. I mean, there are no experts, in my opinion. We all have something to learn, and that's why we really got to network and communicate with each other. Uh, through the process of building the, the, the organization, we did help form uh, the Association of Community-Based Gang Intervention Workers. It is uh, made up of about 70% former gang members who are now doing work to end the violence in the communities. Um, some of the people are here from the association. If you guys want to just stand up real quick, I know you probably don't want to do it, but. <laughs> fact that we're able to bring people together because uh, if you think it's hard bringing gangs together, think about the organizations that are supposed to be working in them. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's bad a lot of times because everybody's fighting over money, people are always fighting over resources. And what we've agreed to do is that we don't do that. We're not going to justify our existence by putting somebody else down. What we're doing is that we're trying to learn how is it that we could work together and how we could um, you know, share each other's resources. There's a lot of things that we don't do. We don't do any tattoo removal programs, but we don't do a number of different things, but we know of other organizations that do. So when they need help, we make our resources available, and when we need help, we know who to go to for help always. And uh, that's something that we've always been able to uh, feel, feel good about. Also, um, you know, we, we're, we know that the work never ends. I mean, we're also involved with uh, uh, creating a juvenile justice uh, partnership where we're looking at broader circles of people. I mean, it's important to, to look at just who's around us, but also understand that, you know, when we talk about policy and, and to make it some real change, I mean, we have to draw the biggest circles of people around us as possible and maintain that relationship and always continue to work with each other and uh, know that, you know, we're always gonna be learning and, and developing. I also wanted to just mention um, that some of the programs that we've established at the university helped us also develop a network on the campus where we are able to utilize the resources of the university by working through these other programs, EOP, Student Support Program, uh, EPIC Program, a number of other campus organizations we've been able to work with in developing networks on campus as well, that we've been able to build that bridge between the university and the community. So when people from the community ask, well, what resources are available, we're also able to say that we know that these other programs exist and these are the services that they provide. You know, we could always take advantage of those resources. You know, and, and it's so important that, you know, I don't know how to stress the whole thing of networking and communication and uh, making sure that people know what resources you have. You know, there's a, there's a lot of people who have come in through the program, uh, a lot of former staff members that, you know, um, that I really wish that we could, um, you know, maintain. The fact is, we just don't got the resources to do it. Um, there's people like Danielle who used to work for us, now that works at our Public Allies. There's people like Marco who, who, who graduated, uh, worked for us for a long time, helped us form the association, who now works, I um, can't remember where you work at right now. <laughs> Alley Care. Uh, there's people like uh, Doug will be graduating in June. You know, he came out of the housing projects right here and um, you know, has really made a name for himself. He was just interviewed by the radio yesterday and, and uh, NPR. And um, you know, I, I'm, uh, you know, I'm proud of the fact that we're able to have influence on other individuals who are able to go out there and have influence. Because um, that's our goal, is to, is, and I, I feel like I'm not necessarily just a project director, but more like, uh, like an educator or, or, or somebody who, who can uh, work with other people and really get them to the point where, you know, they're going out there and making changes among themselves. Because I know one of these people, or all of them, you know, are gonna be a lot greater than I could ever be. And, um, you know, and, it, and it's, it's um, something that I, that I look forward to when the, when the day comes when one of them takes my job. Um, also, I wanted to just mention that, um, that we can't uh, feel comfortable with the work that we've done. The things have to continue always being changed or challenged or worked on, especially right now because in California or Los Angeles, we are facing a real increase when it comes to getting
left um, to celebrate their work. I also want to, as Gary, thank uh, the staff and the board of the Multicultural Collaborative and so many of you who I'm seeing for the first time again in about a year since I moved up to the Bay Area. Uh, it's good to be back in Los Angeles where I feel that I really learned so much about community organizing, uh, equity, and what, you know, what humanity is all about. Uh, I wanted to, even though uh, the Crate Resource Center didn't really want to emphasize, and I understand the, the thrust of their work, and I had the pleasure of being at a conference that they organized shortly after 1992, I think at the Unitarian Church, and I was surprised as a Chicano to, under, to hear the depth of political analysis from looking at the institutional equity issues because up to that point, my own notions of the Korean American community were what was in the media. You know, that the Korean community was portrayed primarily just as merchants, uh, et cetera, and a people that really supposedly didn't have a consciousness about the issues that people of color had faced in this country, and working class people and women. And I really uh, value that time, and I really am honored to be the person to uh, invite them here to, to receive their award and to share about their work. And I want to say how much I respect their work and salute them. But I also want to digress a little bit from the point that uh, is in the, in the written remarks, if you all will look at in the document. Of, tells their history better than I can tell it. But the notion of not wanting to have their political work framed around the victimization of, of Korean Americans, I totally understand that. But at the same time, I want to talk a little bit about what does it mean for a Korean Resource Center or Kiwa or some other group of Koreans to stand up after 1992 and really uh, deal with the issues at the root cause of the problems when uh, their, their community, if you think about them collectively. You know, co-director Ruben Lizardo, who is now in California tomorrow, will you please come up?
basically within the frame of what uh, Che Guevara, who most of you all probably heard of, uh, has famously quoted as saying that at the sound of, at the risk of sounding ridiculous, uh, let me say that a great, all great revolutions are motivated with great sentiments of love. And I think that very often when we share our, the reasons why we do our work, very often we don't actually say what's underneath the political work. And I, I'm really good, glad to see Roz uh, here, because uh, I think there are people before us who really led out in the struggle in groups like the Korean Resource Center who are taking the responsibility for teaching people in their own community about the history of this country. Uh, but it really does to organize around your interests, whether it's the health, uh, the low uh, with them. And I think that that is. And uh, I'm going to say thank you for the MCC selecting our Korean Resource Center as your uh, recipient of our words. Uh, I'm Jimmy Choi, not Ivo. <laughs> Ivo is there. I'm representing the Korean Resource Center as a chairperson of board members. The uh, Korean Resource Center was established in 1983. So next year, uh, February, we want to celebrate 20 years foundations. So we are invited all of you. After 1992, we uh, did a lot of things for the Korean community. And so detailed, we'll tell you, uh, they will prepare for this speech. So uh, first of all, Susan, I'm going to talk a little bit about for you. Uh, David Song will uh, tell you something about our activity. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, David Song from the Korean Resource Center. And at first I was going to make fun of him a little bit because I thought he'd be sitting down here while we were giving the speech, but uh, I guess since we're all up here together. Um, KRC first opened its doors back in uh, February 5th, 1983, when a bunch of Koreans came together because they wanted to discuss some of the political concerns of the growing community. And at that time, they, wanted, they, they had a plan for the center as like a, a training center for young activists you know, who would work for social justice on, a, on an international level. And uh, so uh, during the first half of that time, we became known for like, solidarity work uh, with other activists on uh, peace and democracy issues in Korea. But then in the, in the early 1990s, you know, you got stuff like an uh, increase in Korean Im immigration to the US. There was a Los Angeles civil unrest. There was a lot of anti-immigrant legislation. And at that time, that's when we began to reassess our emphasis on some of our issues and decided to focus on you know, what was happening back at home. And as a result of that, for the last uh, eight or nine years, you know, we've been working on educating and organizing you know, our community around some of the issues that we all face together, whether it's economic injustice, labor solidarity, or uh, you know, fighting racism. And uh, we think you know, one of the most important things about uh, doing all this work now is that we have to you know, work together because these issues affect all of us. And you know, to this end, we try to actively participate in uh, coalition efforts. Like uh, back in uh, a couple of years ago in June, we, we joined the uh, Metro Alliance, ACLU, the SEIU, Local 345, and the Public Allies in their CURE program, which was uh, was a community united for real empowerment about you know the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment and uh, you know a lot of the issues with the neighborhood councils, which were, were not really uh, which were pretty ineffective. And so you know we work together with uh, other groups in that respect to provide you know, a pre American voice. And uh, some of the other issues that we've been working on together is uh, the full participation of the Rigging Campaign, which uh, Susan's going to talk about. My name is Susan Che, and I'm advocacy director at the Korean Resource Center. So I was going to tell you a little bit about our full participation in immigrants campaign. With the launch of the full participation of immigrants campaign in 2000, KRC sought to change, sought to change on a federal legislative level. Through outreach efforts, within two weeks, approximately 12,000 people had signed letters, which were sent to the DNC and RNC, calling for the legalization of immigrants and the restoration of benefits. 
KRC also engaged in civil rights advocacy, mobilizing a busload of seniors, young adults, and children to the AFL-CIO Immigrant Workers Town Hall meeting at the LA Sports Arena on June 10, 2000. Working in unity, demands were made for the basic liberties of undocumented workers. Our efforts showed that immigrant communities could be brought together. The latter right component of the campaign laid the foundation for future advocacy and organizing work. It affirmed the Korean American community's concern and support for legalization policies an issue that's often controversial for the general public. I'd also like to mention two other events that were milestones for our community. In May 2000, a group of Korean senior citizens staged a sit-in at the governor's office to demand an extension for a cafe. In May of 2001, Immigrant Day in Sacramento, organized by the California Immigrant Welfare Collaborative, community members from Koreatown, Korean seniors and Latino youth took the bus together to lobby with groups from across the state regarding state benefit programs for immigrants and access to higher education by pushing for AB 540. Through meetings with legislators, seniors also began to advocate for the needs of the students, while students began to speak out for the needs of CAP, need of CAPI for immigrant seniors. In closing, uh, as we continue our work together in an era that's become increasingly hostile to immigrant and labor rights, in which an increasingly large proportion of our national military budget, uh, national budget is dedicated to the military, I'd like to remind you of a larger international framework for the rights in which we all fight for. Article 25 of the 1948 United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. Everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care, and necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or the light, light, lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond his control. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, everybody, and thank you, MCC, and uh, Ruha, for a wonderful introduction.
These are all the different organizers who felt it wasn't enough just to bring together the organizers um, to, to work on these issues, but it was important to bring together the workers. And that by bringing together the workers and men, um, a warm welcome from um, us immigrant workers, our, our organization of immigrant workers. Uh, my name is Lorenzo Sermieta. Uh, a Filipino immigrant from the Philippines. And we are happy to be a part of this uh, very uh, sincere effort, uh, sincere movement, um, uh, people's movement. At bilang isang Pilipina, papasalamat po kami sa parangal na inyong ibinigay sa amin. And uh, we'd like to thank you very much, the MCC, for giving us this award. At mabuhay ang mga migranteng manggagawa dito sa Estados Unidos. And long live the struggles of uh, immigrant workers here in America. Uh, 한인 노동자 설명을 드리자면요. 이 이민자 대사면 활동은 지금 어, 미국의 저임금 어, 노동력을 제공하고 있는 코리안 커뮤니티, 라틴어 커뮤니티, 필리핀어 커뮤니티, 디아들 커뮤니티가 어, 미국 경제에 기여하고 있는 음, 주축을 이루고 있기 때문에 이분들한테 적당히 합법적인 신분을 제공을 해서 더 나은 커뮤니티 발전에 기여하는 것에 저희가 동참하는 활동이고요. 그리고 오늘 이 상을 받게 된 거는 이미그랜 월커들과 이미그랜 피플들이 더 많이 어, 피해서 화합할 수 있는 것에 더 많은 일을 하라는 뜻으로 어, 이미그랜 월커들과 이미그랜 피플들을 대신해서 받겠습니다. 감사합니다. Uh. A short explanation of Milan's legalization campaign is that the uh, many immigrant workers in the Korean, Latino, and Filipino communities work in low-wage jobs, and they sh deserve the benefits and the rights that the United States can give them as citizens. Um, and I accept this award for immigrant workers today, and see this award um, as uh, as. Presentando a los jornaleros de aquí de Los Ángeles, les agradecemos a MSI y a Angélica también de estar apoyando a nosotros los jornaleros. His name is Héctor de Legón. Héctor es un delegado que está aquí hoy para presentar la Multicultural Collaborative para el award y también agradeciendo a Angélica. And that, that was his salute. And uh, we will have, I think, Kimmy Lee to say a few words. And thank you. Uh, my name is Kimmy Lee, and invite all of you to come out to May 1 next week, where we'll be marching for legalization. 6 p.m. We're meeting at Olympic and Broadway, so please join us. <laughs>